Welcome back to Hardware Unbox for part two of the August 2020 Q&A series. Part one obviously had lots of great questions, so if you missed out on that, that's already up on the channel, you can go back and watch that. But for now, we've got Monitor Steve here, and I think we're ready to go into another set of questions, so let's get into it. Today's video sponsor is Thermal Grizzly and their Cryonaut Extreme, which is now available in a two gram syringe. This high performance thermal paste delivers maximum thermal conductivity thanks to an extremely small particle size and layer thickness. It's also very flexible, capable of standing up to sub-zero temperatures for extreme overclocking, but also performs exceptionally well for air and water cooling applications. So if your CPU or GPU needs repasting, then I suggest checking out the Thermal Grizzly range. Link is in the video description. Okay, Tim, have you found time to construct a shrine for the stash, our fallen facial hair soldier? Mm. Yep. Well, you got the power tools out and started building something? <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately, the actual, you know, I've seen some questions, people asking me, you know, how much money did you sell the moustache for on eBay and all that sort of stuff? No, unfortunately, the moustache, it's just in the bin because, <gasps> um, yeah, I couldn't bear to no. to sell it or anything. It's way, way too far, I think. Um, I saw Gamers Nexus suggesting that we sort of try and glue it onto a mannequin and put it in the background. All very, very difficult tasks, um, far beyond testing monitors or motherboards or GPUs. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, we've sort of buried the moustache for now, um, had a little private ceremony, let's say, and uh, we'll just move on with the, the standard uh, clean-shaved or, you know, standard facial hair look, and otherwise we'll get too sad about the moustache not being around anymore. All right, with HDMI 2.1 gaining more traction in the mainstream, when do you expect DisplayPort 2.0 to finally become more adopted in monitors? Uh, do you expect 4K high refresh rate gaming to be affordable uh, by then? Yeah. What do you um, reckon, Tim? I think DisplayPort 2.0 is a bit different to the HDMI 2.1 situation in that DisplayPort 1.4 with DSC is perfectly fine for most monitor technologies that we've got now. I mean, this is, for example, right here. This is a 4K 144Hz monitor. HDMI 2.0, you can't run it at 144Hz, so you need HDMI 2.1. But DisplayPort 1.4 can run this monitor at 144Hz, no problems with DSC. And of course, some people have opinions, you know, saying, oh, DSC potentially is inferior. Again, it's meant to be a lossless compression technology. Uh, lossless compression technology or very close to lossless so you don't see any issues with that and certainly you know, i've got the uh the odyssey neo g9 just sitting over there as well again that's what 5120 by 1440 at 240 hertz again that runs fine over displayport 1.4 so it's not necessary right now to have displayport 2.0 so i think that's going to really delay its adoption because if there's no need to have more expensive displayport connectors and stuff you wouldn't you just wouldn't bother putting them in. It's really going to be for, you know, we might see a 4K monitor like this at 240 hertz or high refresh rates, you know, needing 10-bit or 12-bit colors, that, that's when you'll need these sort of DisplayPort 2.0 connectors. So I think we've seen rumors lately about the next generation of GPUs from Intel, AMD, potentially NVIDIA as well, using DisplayPort 2.0. They'll be nice for future-proofing, but I don't expect monitors to bother implementing it for quite some time, at least until the resolution and refresh rate requirements really dictate it. So would you say that Intel might have a chance in beating DLSS with their XESS? After all, it is temporal and it does use deep learning. It's just not hardware accelerated. So, well, firstly, that last part about it not being hardware accelerated is sort of true, sort of not true. It sounds like XESS will have two different pathways that will be able to run. One is going to be XNX accelerated, so that will be hardware accelerated, but only on Intel GPUs specifically. And then the other way to run it, sort of the fallback way on other GPUs, older GPUs, potentially integrated graphics as well, will be the DP4A methods so that will work on AMD's latest GPUs, NVIDIA's latest GPUs, and, and so on, and won't necessarily be hardware accelerated. It's going to depend on how those GPUs deal with those instructions. So that's that topic sort of solved for now. Do they have a chance in beating DLSS? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, th they do. I think Intel has got a lot of expertise in AI. Certainly, they've been doing lots of research into that. So I certainly think that from that perspective, that Intel has what it takes to develop this sort of software feature. I think it's mostly going to hinge on, as always, game integration. 
Um, and the fact that it's you know more of an open technology, the fact that it's going to work on opposition GPUs is going to help them in their case of beating the sort of closed source DLSS solution. So they've certainly got a chance of doing it. It's all about the execution and especially getting it into games because, yeah, like we sort of seen with FSR, it doesn't necessarily need to be 100% as good or better than DLSS. It can succeed in other areas like having wide support and wide game support. But again, it's going to be a challenge for Intel to get it into those required games. Is that sort of how you would see it? Yeah, I think it's a pretty thorough answer. Um, not much more you can really say at this point. So yeah, I totally agree. With this reignited discussion on cores for gaming, let's look at it from a different perspective. Why do games suck at utilizing cores? And do you, in your professional opinion, see this changing in the future, for example, with better implementation of Vulkan or DX12? Uh, well, I would argue that they don't suck, to be honest. I mean, looking closely, especially the bigger AAA tiles that we typically test with over the last few years, a lot of them utilize eight or more cores very well, or at least they spread the load across the, you know, eight or more cores very well. So if you have a, a lower end eight core processor, you will see utilization higher on that, though something like a Ryzen 7 1800X, the frame rate will be lower, which does lower CPU utilization. But the point is, I think the games are spreading the load really well and using as much of the CPU as they need to to at least do what they do in the game. I think the sort of, from your angle, where you're saying is they're not fully utilizing the higher end CPUs like your Ryzen 7 5800X, 5900X, and the 11th gen parts. And I'd say the reason for that is the fact that if you look at, I know it's not super accurate, but it's a pretty good rough guide, the Steam Hardware Survey, looking at that, 40% of all Steam users that take the Steam Hardware Survey say that they still use a quad core CPU, whether that's four cores, four threads, or four cores, eight threads, doesn't really matter. Point is, that's the amount of processing power they have. Uh, and what, what's like the fastest quad core at the moment? It's like the Core i7 7700K Something and around the there. Ryzen yep. 3 3300X. They're about the same, I think, and they're the fastest quad cores available or thereabouts. Taking all that information in, basically game developers, even today, they don't want to be alienating 40% of their customer base. If they make a game that requires even something like a, a six core processor with the performance of the Ryzen 5 5600X, there's going to be so many people that will not be able to play that game. And while we are seeing a shift towards that slowly, it's not going to happen overnight where all of a sudden you need a high end eight core processor. So they do spread the load, so you get a nicer, smoother experience with those high-end parts, or at least a, a powerful six-core processor, but it's still pretty well playable on like a four-core, uh, eight-thread CPU, such as the 7700K or whatever. So that's sort of the reason. You've got to remember you can't be leaving a huge part of your customer base behind when releasing a new game, because that just really heavily impacts your sales yeah. in a negative way. I think most game developers as well, they want the games to be running mostly GPU limited for that reason. It tends to be easier to scale <laughs> GPU features. So turning yes. on or off features like shadows or even just something as basic as the resolution is generally speaking, very GPU, very GPU dependent. So you can scale across that wide range of GPUs that people have with those features. Whereas CPU features, yeah, you can scale a few things like you know draw distance and level of detail type effects on the CPU or NPC counts. You see that in games from time to time. But mm -hmm. a lot of the time, if you make a game, let's say, and you want to put thousands of NPCs in it, and then you also let people scale that down to you know a handful of NPCs on lower end CPUs, that has pretty significant gameplay implications, whereas changing the resolution or changing the shadows doesn't necessarily have that same sort of effect. That's right. So I think that's why Everyone's we see a similar experience. Yeah, it's why we see much narrower CPU related features and why mm -hmm. you see these modern eight core and even six core processors sitting with very low utilization because they just can't push those effects at the moment. Obviously, as you said, that, that mm -hmm. is going to change. The other thing as well yeah. with, with utilization is that, you know, those numbers that you see don't aren't always a hundred percent accurate in the bottlenecks of the CPU and you know the actual mm -hmm. utilization because something like those old first gen Ryzen processors, they may be only utilizing you know thirty or forty percent, but they may be limited by the amount of cache that they have, the latencies to the memory, cache latencies, all those sorts of things, which don't 
they don't really come across in those utilization numbers. Yeah, the whole utilization thing, I mean, even testing CPUs in general can be a bit misleading because if you're looking for how heavily utilized something like a Ryzen 5 uh, 5600X is, that's a very fast CPU that can push very high frame rates, basically as high as the 16 core variant. But to see it very heavily utilized, you've got to pick a game where it does render or allow hundreds of FPS to be rendered with a high end GPU. And then you do see quite high utilization. You can get up around the 80% mark and you think, oh, okay, well that's, you're sort of starting to get to the point where you're using all of that CPU and it's not long before you run out of headroom. But if you dial back the FPS to like 144 FPS, say your frame cap it there, just or just below your monitor's refresh rate for that, the, the sweet spot with input you know, latency, well, the CPU utilization drops away heavily. Like you could be halving the CPU utilization in that instance. So, yeah, it's a bit of a, a complex discussion, and it can often be quite misleading as to how heavily you really are utilizing your CPU. Uh, because again, you're probably not using something like an RX 6900 XT at 1080p with whatever CPU it is. You're probably running at 1440p, and again, that will see that you're mostly GPU bound or becoming more GPU bound and that will again lower the CPU requirements. So yep. it's a balancing act. But basically, by determining what kind of CPU you need to play at 1440p or 4K by testing at 1080p with a flagship GPU, not a great <laughs> way of doing it to be honest, but it does let you know how different CPUs differ in terms of performance. So obviously it makes sense for CPU testing. Why does it seem PCI Express Gen 4 is so short-lived versus PCI Express Gen 3? Should we expect Gen 5 to be equally short-lived? Mm. Hmm. I don't I don't know if Gen 4 has been necessarily short-lived. And it's not like because the PCI Express specification is backwards compatible, it's not like PCI Express Gen 4 graphics cards become obsolete like you can't use them in a gen 5 system yeah so in that sense it it doesn't really matter too much and yeah i mean we get to see a, a system support you know gen 5 we know it is upcoming uh, but whether it comes to the mainstream you know, anytime soon i don't know what are your thoughts on this one tim yeah i think this is just a simple situation where gen 3 was unusually long-lived as opposed to more being mm -hmm. gen 4 short-lived um, you know, there's, and there's a number of reasons for that. You know, Intel, for example, had stagnating CPUs for a large portion of the Gen 3 era. So they make mm -hmm. Skylake, that obviously supports PCI 3.0, that was back in 2017. And only at the end of 2021 are we upgrading to sort of the, well, I guess we had Rocket Lake as well, which does support PCI 4.0 earlier this year. So 2021 is sort of the, the time that we ticked over to 4.0. And again, the CPU architecture was largely the same throughout that whole generation. And then again, AMD came in, they had their first CPUs on 3.0 and upgraded to 4.0 halfway through. So I think that's sort mm -hmm. of part of the reason to explaining why Gen 3 has been around for so long. And now it seems like we're going Gen 4 and Gen 5 is because, yes, yeah, CPU advancements are sort of accelerating at a rapid pace. And there's no point making you know, all your GPUs and peripherals use a gen of PCIe that the latest CPUs can't use at all. Like there's just, you wouldn't bother with upgrading your architectures for those capabilities. So I think there's or, they've already announced the PCIe Gen 6 specification. I'm not sure whether it's finalized mm -hmm. at this point, but it's meant to be coming within a couple of years after Gen 5. So I would expect that these sort of things are gonna be rapidly advancing once again, now that we're sort of seeing all these big advancements in CPUs. And, that's really one area where having better CPUs and more advancements can help out in other areas as well. All right, with Windows 11 expected to overhaul CPU scheduling for impending Intel Elder Lake release, do you anticipate these scheduling changes to impact other designs such as ARM or NUMA and multi-socket configurations? Hmm. Um, uh, probably I'm, not. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, pro probably not. It, it really sounds like with Alder Lake that Intel has worked pretty closely with Microsoft, and it's not just mm -hmm. it's not just the Windows 11 stuff that is helping scheduling on Alder Lake. Alder Lake's got their new Thread Director hardware scheduling feature, which needs to work with Windows 11. So they both need to go hand in hand, but it's not one or, or the other sort of situation. So I don't think that the 
schedule the scheduling improvements probably are going to help to some degree but it really is that integration between the cpu and the os that is going to make older lake potentially depending on benchmarks and investigations uh work as mm -hmm. intended and if you know arm cpus multi-socket configurations don't have that hardware level thread scheduling you know capabilities or advanced telemetry then they're not going to see any advancements or improvements so mm -hmm. i guess that kind of where that one lies Next question, why do people pick NVIDIA over AMD? I recently had a friend choose to pay $600 for an RTX 3060 versus $480 for a 6700 XT since they said AMD is no hold. I couldn't change their mind. I think AMD GPUs have come a long way recently. Yeah, 3060 over a 6700 XT for more money. <laughs> From my perspective, that stings, but I'm guessing Steve might have a few opinions on why people might make that sort of decision. Yeah, I mean, for people like us who chop and change between the two and we sort of know what each offers and we're quite comfortable with the Radeon GPUs. We didn't have the driver issues that we've covered on the channel at length, but people are aware of them, they've heard of them. And I I guess it's just a simple human nature thing. Like when you go with a thing, you, you buy something and you invest in it and it gives you a good experience and you feel like that was a good investment, you're more likely to do that again. And that's why we see people sticking with certain car brands or whatever it may be, because they had a good experience with them. And if they buy a certain car and they get unlucky and it's a lemon, they, they're typically not going back to that brand. That's when they'll change and try something different. Uh, so, I, that, and that's a point we brought up with the 5700 XT. There was a lot of people who were like, I was going to get a 2070 Super or a 2060 Super, but the 5700 XT just seems to offer so much more value. So I'm willing to give it a shot. But then there was the black screen issues and stuff like that. And it was really, AMD sort of blew a chance there to, to capture a lot of new, uh, well, sort of uh, customers. So NVIDIA, stronger market share, more mind share. They've already established that name. He's got to try and claw it back and, and win that back. And they've got to do that with more enticing products, which is why I think you and I strongly agree that RDNA 2 is a missed opportunity. Uh, if they had a lot more stock, pricing somewhat yep. irrelevant, but if they had a lot more stock, people who could, you know, wanted an RTX 3080 and couldn't get one were like, well, you know, the 6700 XT is there for a, you know, a reasonable price and there's stock. So, I'm not going to sit around and wait till, you know, how long am I going to be waiting to get an RTX 3080? I might as well just buy this Radeon GP and give it a shot. And I actually had a couple of friends who did that. They, when they first launched in Australia, we did have a surplus of 6700 XTs because of reasons we're talking about here, where people were like, no, I'm not touching the 6700 XT. I really want an RTX 3070. I had a few friends that went with the Radeon GPU and they've used GeForce GPUs pretty much all their lives. And they're quite shocked by how good the 6700 XT is, by how good the the Radeon control panel is, how good the software is. They're expecting some clunky old sort of ancient software that didn't work terribly well based on what they heard on forums or from other people. And they're like, you know, recording gameplay is actually easier and the interface is better than what I had on my GeForce GPU. So I've got a lot of that sort of feedback. But yeah, convincing people to do it, it's another thing because... Well, for all the reasons we've spoke of. Yeah, and it's not, it's not helping with the latest uh, feature disparity between NVIDIA and AMD. You know, they're already battling all the things that you've said about lots of people yep. already have NVIDIA GPUs, brand perception, market share, all that. And then on top of that, NVIDIA does have the superior product based on, mm -hmm. you know, the performance is very competitive. And then they're adding things like the better ray tracing performance, DLSS, you know, their encoder features, which again, probably might need a bit of an update on you know, to see which one is in the lead, but they do have a very strong encoder support, CUDA support, mm -hmm. uh, all, all these sorts of features mm -hmm. that they're sort of, you know, you kind of feel like if you're buying a 6700 XT that you're missing out on, on ray tracing support or that you're missing out on DLSS. Even though a 6700 XT does support ray tracing, there is still that perception that you need the RTX GPU to get ray tracing, which is going to swing people over to cars like an RTX 3060 even though it's more expensive and in most games is a lesser performing GPU. So yeah, there's again, lots of work AMD needs to do in these things. And I totally agree when you say that they kind of missed the opportunity to flood the GPU, mm. flood the market with their GPUs this generation when their competitor is struggling to meet the demand from, from buyers. But hasn't happened, unfortunately, for AMD and they're just going to have to keep executing to 
get people over, I guess. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're well aware that there's a limited seven nanometer wafer supply and, you know, they've got as much as they can get and they've got to produce so many different products and there's so many different markets they've got to service with that allocation and they will have done the calculations and worked out where, you know, they're best off investing. But yeah, I feel like, you know, the Radeon GPUs, it's a huge market and they could have really capitalized on the current situation and done a lot better there. But they didn't for reasons that probably make sense to them or make sense in general. But yeah, seems to us like opportunity missed. Why are manufacturers like MSI creating so many different variations of the same graphics card or the same GPU, basically? So as an example here, 3080 Ti variants, there's just so many of them. Uh, it just is overwhelming. So why not create just one or two uh, successful variants? Which I guess sort of the smaller partners like Power Color, they tend to do that. Like you get the hell well they do like three now you get the fight of the hellhound and the red devil and then sometimes you get like a liquid cooled devil or whatever so even the uh, smaller guys do have more than two variants for the most part but why are there so many different variants is the question and really probably a few different reasons you can bet that companies like msi have been doing this for a while so they've sort of optimized their product lines and then then they're not overwhelming people to the point where they just don't buy anything uh, they're trying to cover various different price points. Uh, they're trying to justify higher margin products, I suppose. And it may even be a situation where they're offering sort of different looking products as well. Like someone wants a black looking graphics card or, you know, you can see that they're all, some of them are subtly different. Some are quite different in their appearance and, and the features they offer. So product segmentation, it's nothing new. And when you're a big company and you can afford to do it, they do it because it generally results in more sales and it allows them to, I guess, another way of looking at it, your old brick and mortar stores, you have two products, two different types of Radeon GPUs and your competitor has six. So they're dominating three times the shelf space. They're more likely to have that convert to a sale and the online store approach is the same thing. You go to like your PC case gear or whoever, and you got MSI, G, MSI, 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 and then like two power colors or whatever. MSI is more likely to get the sale. Uh, it just looks like a stronger brand, I suppose. Yeah, I think part of it as well that you haven't touched on is these these GPUs, there's kind of a price gap between one GPU and the next. So you sort of got your 3060 Ti at, say, $400, your 3070 at $500. So then the AOBs think, okay, well, we can sell in $20 increments between $400 and $500, or even you have your top-end 3060 Ti's be priced above the lowest tier 3070s, and that just gives people the maximum amount of choice that they could possibly have. So, uh, oh, I've got $440 exactly to spend on a GPU. Well, that means I can get the 3060 Ti at the second from bottom variant, or whatever the case is for that, that line. So I think they just got, kind of flood the market, in addition to all the things that you were saying, and so, yeah, just there's always that product available for the person that's ready to go right there for the amount of money that they want to spend. So you end up with the full stack of $20 increments from right down the bottom end of the GPU line, up and up and up and up. Yeah. And um, to make it, well, not overwhelming, during normal times, you would just buy the card at or very near the MSRP and ignore the premium cards unless you're shopping for a flagship GPU. But Something like an RTX 3060 Ti, you would be going very near to that MSRP to get the most bang for your buck. And you just have to do a bit of research who offers the best quality uh, MSRP card, and there you go. Yeah, and they like to differentiate with things like factory OC versus non-OC mm -hmm. cards, which tends to get people to sale. And just, as you say, basic stuff like two fans versus three fans. People might want the mm -hmm. three fan ver variant. Yeah, it's, it all gets down to simple stuff like that. Next question, new Intel processors will support both DDR4 and DDR5. What is your opinion about that? Does it mean that there will be no big difference between them or is it a cost saving thing because DDR5 will be expensive at first? So we've seen this before, haven't we? Yeah, back in 2015, at least one example, when Intel released the Skylake architecture, the first wave of motherboards uh, supported DDR3 or DDR4. Yep. So that was pretty interesting. Mind you, you couldn't, you had to pick one memory type. You couldn't use like, you know, a DDR3 stick with a DDR4 stick. Uh, you had to pick one or the other. Uh, and I guess that 
incentivized people to upgrade it, made it a bit cheaper, which it is a cost saving exercise for the uh, consumer because if they've got some expensive DDR3 memory in the case of Skylake, they can carry that over to that new platform and it means they just need a new motherboard and CPU. So yep. yeah, I mean, memory these days isn't terribly expensive. So I guess there's less reason to do that. And it'd probably make a, like the DDR4 to DDR5 thing with the upcoming platforms, it'd probably make a little bit more sense with like your really budget entry level motherboards where you are trying to save every last dollar. But then even then it's probably like, you're probably just better off buying the previous generation part at a discounted price if if that um if that comes up. Sort of like what we saw with like Zen Plus and Zen 2, for example. Uh, with DDR4 and DDR5, it is definitely gonna be a situation where you have to pick one or the other. Personally, I would recommend avoiding the hybrid boards that do both and just get yourself a DDR5 board and buy the DDR5 memory. Of course, you gotta wait till the benchmarks and see what's worth doing, but, yeah, uh, I think initially, at least at the sort of JetX spec, DDR5 won't be any faster or much faster than your higher spec DDR4 modules, but then you're sort of comparing premium DDR4 with entry-level DDR5, and then yep. I don't know what the pricing's going to be. So, But I think my gut instincts would be to avoid those hybrid boards, get a DDR5 board, because you usually get four slots, uh, four DIMM slots for DDR5, and yep. yeah. Do you think we will be seeing combo motherboards again, like the DDR3 to DDR4 transition period? So I assume this is for upcoming Alder Lake designs with your DDR4 to DDR5. What do you think, Steve, the motherboard man? Uh, <laughs> the motherboard man. I think so, because while well, we have seen these before, especially with our Intel platforms, a sort of hybrid transitional thing, DDR3, DDR4, DDR4 to DDR5. So I think we will see that. I hope we'll see it only because it makes benchmarking quite interesting and a lot easier because you can actually test the same CPU with different memory. So a bit of an apples to apples comparison there. But having said that, I don't think you should buy them. Uh, well, at least for most of you, we'll see. We'll test it and we'll really find out. This is obviously my sort of preliminary take on it, which could end up being wrong. But historically, yeah, best not to buy those boards because it does limit you to two DIMMs for the memory type of your choosing, which makes it difficult to upgrade from 16 to 32 megabytes or 32 megabytes to 64 megabytes in the future, if that's something you want to do. Gigabytes, I'm you sure you meant, your... but yeah. What did I say? I think you said megabytes. Oh, uh, yeah, probably gigabytes would be better. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, definitely do gigabytes. <laughs> But yeah, so it makes that expanding your capacity in gigabytes uh, much easier. Thank you, Tim. Yep. Um, so I think that's basically, yeah, I think we will see them. That's the question answered. Okay. Will you be hiring the new guy soon? Seems pretty good. Yeah. The new guy's not too bad. Hasn't quite got the same presence as the old guy. The old guy was very commanding with, with very little effort, it seemed. But yeah, the new guy... I think he can he can sort of work his way into the role and and fill those shoes. Not sure. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Obviously, it really depends on what you guys think. Uh, but so far, you guys seem to be warming up to the new guy quite well. So, yeah, that's that's good news, new guy. Why hasn't AMD created a reference model for the 6600 XT? Does doing this benefit AMD in some way? Uh, it's almost as if AMD are trying to hide something from the off. Don't know if I'd. So if I'd sort of read that much into it and say they're trying to hide something by not creating a reference card, because let's be honest, it's not that abnormal. Usually with the lower end models, we don't get a reference card and that uh, is not just AMD. Also, NVIDIA tends not to do that as well. What was the lowest reference card we got? Was it the RTX 2060 from the previous generation? And then yeah, the that's 16 right. yep. series were all AIBs. So yeah, look, it's not that strange. I don't know if they have or haven't created a reference 6600 XT. We know there's sort of an, well, there appears to be an OEM spec 6600 XT, which is that Biostar card, quite shockingly, that I reviewed. So whether that is the AMD reference card, uh, AMD certainly aren't admitting it, <laughs> and they were very quick to swipe any suggestion that that was the reference card. But the jig will be up if we start seeing a lot of OEM systems using the Biostar card, because it'll be quite clear that that is the AMD OEM spec. Very disappointing if that is the case, but yeah, we'll have to um, give them the benefit of the doubt, I suppose, for now, and then see, yeah, if the Biostar card starts appearing 
in systems that Biostar had nothing to do with. Yeah, and there's usually a reference board for almost every single GPU that's made, yes. right? So even if we get you know, a 6600 XT with no reference card or no you know, 1660 mm-hmm. Ti in the previous gen with no reference card, there can still be the board which you can basically just that, choose that and then put whatever cooler on top that you want. Uh, that, that's a good point. I sh- yes, I should have uh, emphasized that. So the Biostar card is 100% based on the AMD reference PCB. Yep. The cooler, though, is the thing we're not sure on. Yeah. So the Power Color Hellhound, for example, that also uses the AMD reference PCB. There's a few subtle differences there. Power Color use what looks to be slightly higher quality inductors when compared to Biostar. But, you know, the PCB was perfectly fine when we chucked the Hellhound cooler on there. We got the exact same thermal and performance results as we did with the uh, Power Color Hellhound. So yeah, there is definitely a reference PCB. Whether that really garbage Biostar cooler that we came across is the the reference OEM spec cooler, there's certainly evidence out there to suggest that that is the case. Uh, and AMD were none too impressed when I put it to them. <laughs> they certainly didn't want that story getting out. But if it is, you know, if you'll it is, see it'll be a obvious. Lot of systems, yeah. it'll be it'll be very obvious. So yeah, I won't be too impressed with AMD if that is the case because they. You know, they were very much deterring me from believing that, that was the case. So I always hate it when these companies lie to us because, yeah, it. I don't believe anything they say. Like AMD, whether they meant to lie to us or not, they certainly lied to us or they ended up lying to us about the pricing and availability of the 6800 series. You know, they, yep. they told Tim and I over the phone that in, I can't remember what the timetable was, it was four or five weeks, uh, we expect that there will be... Uh, they basically promised us there will be MSRP cards, which looking back is a, a hilarious promise to make at the time, and we sort of felt that at the time. But when it came to the 6600 XT uh, promises prior to launch, we were sort of having none of it because we are like, well, we're not falling for that one again. You know the old saying? Yep. So, yeah. All right, I guess that just about does it for this Q&A segment for August. We've still got another part that we will be putting up on the channel shortly, which... Well, these days it's usually just a mix of Patreon and Floatplane and YouTube questions throughout all the episodes, but it used to be the Patreon-specific one. But yeah, anyway, anyway, we'll leave that to the editing process. But yeah, there will be more questions to be answered. We already answered more questions than in this video as well, if you want to go back and watch that. And yeah, then it's just, if you're interested in supporting the channel, you're probably part of the 20% Club if you've reached this part of like a 30-minute long Q&A series. So thank you for all the support. and for watching these videos through to the end. And yeah, thanks to Discord, uh, Access, Patreon, Floatplane, early access videos on Floatplane, all that stuff's in the description below. Anything else to say at the end of this one? I think you've done a pretty good job there, Tim. I think the only thing left to say is, I'm your host, Steve. I'm your host, Tim. We'll see you. See you next time.